Cotton Massacre, which transpired in 1940, stands as a harrowing testament to the brutality of the Soviet Union during that era. This horrific event encompassed a series of mass executions that claimed the lives of nearly 22,000 Polish military officers and intellectuals who were held as prisoners of war. The executions were orchestrated by the Soviet Union, specifically by the NKVD, also known as the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, the notorious Soviet secret police. These gruesome killings took place in April and May 1940 and were not limited to the Cotton Forest. Similar atrocities occurred in Kalinin, Kharkiv, and other locations. Nonetheless, it is the Cotton Forest that lent its name to this massacre, as it was there that German Nazi forces initially stumbled upon some mass graves. The order to execute these captive members of the Polish officer corps was clandestinely issued by the Soviet Politburo, led by Joseph Stalin himself. Of the total number of victims, approximately 8,000 were officers who had been imprisoned during the 1939 Soviet invasion of Poland. Another 6,000 were police officers, and the remaining 8,000 were Polish intellectuals whom the Soviets deemed to be intelligence agents and gendarmes, spies and saboteurs, former landowners, factory owners, and officials. It is important to note that the Polish army officer class represented the diverse ethnic makeup of the Polish state. Those murdered included ethnic Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and even 700 to 900 Polish Jews, among them the chief rabbi of the Polish army, Baruch Steinberg. The discovery of mass graves in the Cotton Forest was first publicized by the government of Nazi Germany in April 1943. In response, Stalin severed diplomatic relations with the London-based Polish government in exile when it requested an investigation by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Following the Vistula Oder Offensive, which brought the mass graves under Soviet control, the Soviet Union claimed that the Nazis were responsible for the killings. This denial persisted until 1990 when the Soviet government officially acknowledged and condemned the massacres carried out by the NKVD, as well as the subsequent cover-up. An investigation conducted by the offices of the Prosecutors General of the Soviet Union, 1990-1991, and later the Russian Federation, 1991-2004, affirmed Soviet responsibility for the massacres. However, it stopped short of categorizing these actions as war crimes or acts of mass murder. The investigation was closed, citing the death of the perpetrators, and the Russian government's reluctance to recognize the deceased as victims of the Great Purge rendered formal posthumous rehabilitation inapplicable. In November 2010, to improve relations with Poland, the Russian state Duma approved a declaration condemning Stalin and other Soviet officials for ordering the massacre. However, as tensions flared in the context of the Russo-Ukrainian war, relations soured once more. In 2021, the Russian Ministry of Culture downgraded the memorial complex at Cotton on its Register of Sites of Cultural Heritage, demoting it from a place of federal importance to one of only regional significance. The ominous storm clouds of World War II gathered on September 1, 1939, as Nazi Germany initiated its invasion of Poland. In response, Britain and France, honoring their commitments under the Anglo-Polish and Franco-Polish Treaties of Alliance, formally declared war on Germany. However, the early stages of this conflict, often referred to as the Phony War, saw little significant military action from these Western powers. Meanwhile, on September 17, the Soviet Union executed its invasion of Poland, in strict accordance with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The Red Army's advance was swift, encountering minimal resistance, largely because Polish forces were ordered not to engage the Soviets. This resulted in the capture and internment of between 250,000 to 454,700 Polish soldiers and policemen by the Soviet authorities. While most of them managed to regain their freedom or escape swiftly, approximately 125,000 individuals found themselves incarcerated in camps administered by the NKVD. Of this captive population, 42,400 soldiers, primarily of Ukrainian and Belarusian descent serving in the Polish army, and residing in the territories of Poland annexed by the Soviet Union, were released from custody in October. Conversely, the 43,000 soldiers who hailed from Western Poland, then under Nazi control, were transferred to German custody. As part of a complex exchange, the Soviets received 13,575 Polish prisoners from the Germans in return. The Soviet regime carried out extensive repressions against Polish citizens during this period. Due to Poland's conscription system, which mandated that nearly all university graduates serve as military reserve officers, the NKVD had the means to apprehend a significant portion of the Polish educated class and label them as prisoners of war. According to estimates by the Institute of National Remembrance IPN, approximately 320,000 Polish citizens were deported to the Soviet Union during this time. 
However, it's worth noting that other historians dispute this figure, adhering to older estimates that range from about 700,000 to 1 million deportations. IPN also revises the number of Polish citizens who perished under Soviet rule during World War II, placing it at 150,000, which is a revision of older estimates that suggested up to 500,000 fatalities. One chilling example of this repression is seen in the fate of the 12,000 Poles sent to the Dolstroy camp near Kalama in 1940-1941, predominantly prisoners of war. Tragically, only 583 men from this group survived and were released in 1942 to join the Polish armed forces in the east. In his research, Tadeusz Piotrowski indicates that during the war and after 1944, 570,387 Polish citizens had been subjected to some form of Soviet political repression. As early as September 19, the head of the NKVD, Lavreni Beria, issued orders to establish the main administration for affairs of prisoners of war and inner knees, tasked with overseeing Polish prisoners. The NKVD took custody of these prisoners from the Red Army and proceeded to set up a network of reception centers and transit camps. They also organized rail transport to convey these individuals to prisoner of war camps in the western regions of the USSR. The largest of these camps were located in Kozelsk, Optina Monastery, Astashkov, Stolivny Island on Lake Seliger near Astashkov, and Starobilsk. Other camps existed in Juknovo, Rail Station Babanino, Uje, Talitsi, Rail Station Tyotkino, 90 km, 56 miles, from Putivil, Kozels China, Oranki, Vologda, Rail Station Zainaikavo, and Gryavits. Kozelsk and Starobilsk primarily housed military officers, while Astashkov mainly held Polish scouts, gendarmes, police officers, and prison officers. Some prisoners belonged to other segments of the Polish intelligentsia, including priests, landowners, and legal professionals. The approximate distribution of men across these camps was as follows, Kozelsk, 5,000, Astashkov, 6,570, and Starobelsk, 4,000, totaling 15,570 men. By a report dated November 19, 1939, the NKVD had approximately 40,000 Polish POWs in its custody comprising 8,000 to 8,500 officers and warrant officers, 6,000 to 6,500 police officers, and 25,000 soldiers and non-commissioned officers who were still classified as POWs. In December, a wave of arrests led to the imprisonment of additional Polish officers. Ivan Serov's report to Lavreni Beria on December 3rd stated that in total, 1,057 former officers of the Polish army had been arrested. The 25,000 soldiers and non-commissioned officers were assigned to forced labor, engaging in road construction and heavy metallurgy tasks. Upon their arrival at the camps between October 1939 and February 1940, the Polish detainees found themselves subjected to extensive interrogations and constant political pressure, often administered by NKVD officers like Vasily Zarubin. Although the prisoners initially held hope for their imminent release, the interviews functioned as a ruthless screening process, determining who would survive and who would face execution. According to NKVD reports, those who could not be coerced into adopting a pro-Soviet stance were labeled as hardened and uncompromising enemies of Soviet authority. On March 5, 1940, following a memorandum from Beria to Joseph Stalin, six members of the Soviet Politburo, Stalin, Vyacheslav Molotov, Lazar Kaganovich, Klimat Voroshilov, Anastas Mikian, and Mikhail Kalinin, issued an order for the execution of 25,700 Polish individuals categorized as nationalists and counter-revolutionaries. These individuals were being held in camps and prisons across occupied western Ukraine and Belarus. The motive behind this massacre, as suggested by historian Gerhard Weinberg, was Stalin's desire to deprive any potential future Polish military of a substantial portion of its skilled personnel. The Soviet leadership, with Stalin at the forefront, perceived the Polish prisoners as a significant challenge, fearing their resistance to Soviet rule. Consequently, they made the fateful decision to classify those confined within the special camps as avowed enemies of Soviet authority, sealing their grim fate. The Cotton Massacre, a horrifying chapter in history, claimed an estimated 22,000 lives, with a confirmed minimum count of 21,768 victims. Soviet documents, declassified in 1990, shed light on the grim reality. After April 3, 1940, a staggering 21,857 Polish internees and prisoners were executed. Among these, 14,552 were prisoners of war, likely originating from the three main camps, and 7,305 were prisoners held in the western regions of the Bielorussian and Ukrainian SSRs. The breakdown of these numbers reveals that 4,421 hailed from Kozelsk, 
3,820 from Starobelsk, 6,311 from Ostashkov, and 7,305 from various prisons in Bielorussia and Ukraine. At the heart of these executions was Pyotr Soprunenko, a major general born near Kiev in the Ukrainian SSR, who held the position of the head of the NKVD administration for affairs of prisoners of war and inner needs. He was directly involved in the gruesome selection process of Polish officers to be executed, all by the directives of Lavreni Beria and Merkulov. The victims at Cotton encompassed a wide spectrum of individuals, including soldiers, including an admiral, two generals, colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors, captains, naval captains, privates, non-commissioned officers, and chaplains. 200 pilots, government officials, and royalty, including a prince and 43 officials. Additionally, civilians from various walks of life, such as landowners, refugees, university professors, physicians, lawyers, engineers, teachers, writers, and journalists, found themselves caught in this tragic web. Shockingly, almost half of the Polish officer corps fell victim to these executions. It is essential to recognize that not all of those executed were ethnic Poles, as the Second Polish Republic was a multi-ethnic state, and its officer ranks included individuals from Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Jewish backgrounds. It is estimated that approximately 8% of the Cotton Massacre victims were Polish Jews. A small number of prisoners, 395 in total, were spared from the slaughter, including notable figures like Stanislaw Swianiewicz and Józef Zopski, who were transported to different locations. The method of execution varied by camp and location. Those from the Kozelsk camp met their fate in the Cotton Forest, while individuals from the Starbelsk camp were killed within the inner NKVD prison of Kharkiv, and their bodies were buried near the village of Piatikotki. Police officers from the Ostashkov camp faced execution in the internal NKVD prison of Kalinin, Tver, and they were interred in Mednoy. Disturbingly, all three of these burial sites had previously served as secret cemeteries for the victims of the Great Purge of 1937-1938, later transformed into recreational areas by the NKVD-KGB. The grim details of the executions in the Kalinin NKVD prison came to light during a hearing, where Dmitry Tokarev, former head of the board of the district NKVD in Kalinin, revealed that the shootings began in the evening and continued until dawn. In an attempt to manage the vast number of executions, the first transport on April 4, 1940, consisted of 390 individuals, though subsequent transports carried no more than 250 people each. The executioners primarily used German-made .25 ACP Walter Model 2 pistols, supplied by Moscow, although Soviet-made 7.62x38MMR Nagant M1895 revolvers were also employed. Notably, German weapons were preferred over standard Soviet revolvers, as the latter were believed to produce too much recoil, causing discomfort after a few executions. The process of execution was methodical and chilling. Once a condemned individual's personal information was verified, they were handcuffed and led to a cell insulated with sandbags along the walls and a heavy, felt-lined door. The victim would kneel in the center of the cell, and an executioner would approach from behind, administering a fatal shot to the back of the head or neck. The lifeless body was then transported out through an opposite door and placed in one of several waiting trucks, making way for the next condemned person to undergo the same dreadful fate. To muffle the sound of the pistol gunshots, the execution cell was lined with rough insulation and loud machinery, potentially fans operated throughout the night. Some revelations post-1991 indicate that prisoners may have been executed similarly at the NKVD headquarters in Smolensk, with the corpses possibly being shot while standing at the edge of mass graves. This macabre routine unfolded each night, except for the public May Day holiday. The tragedy extended to Ukrainian and Belarusian prisons, where an estimated 3,000 to 4,000 Polish inmates met their end. They were likely buried in Bykovnia and Kuropaty, respectively, adding to the grim tally. Among the victims were around 50 women, including Clara Auerbach Margules and Stella Menkas, along with Lt. Janina Lewandowska, the daughter of General Józef Dauber Musnicki. Shockingly, she was the sole female POW executed during the Cotton Massacre. Questions about the fate of the Polish prisoners arose shortly after the commencement of Operation Barbarossa in June 1941. At that time, the Polish government in exile and the Soviet government entered into the sikorsky maisky Agreement. This agreement signaled their joint commitment to combat Nazi Germany, including the formation of a Polish army on Soviet soil. General Władysław Anders took charge of organizing this army and soon sought information about the whereabouts of the missing Polish officers. In a personal meeting, Joseph Stalin reassured General Anders and Władysław Sikorski, 
the Polish Prime Minister, that all the Polish prisoners had been released. Stalin attributed the inability to account for all of them to the Soviets having lost track of some in Manchuria. Investigations into the fate of the Polish officers were conducted, including by individuals like Józef Zopski between 1941 and 1942. However, it wasn't until 1942, when the territory around Smolensk came under German occupation, that captive Polish railroad workers learned from residents about a mass grave of Polish soldiers near Kozelsk, close to Katyn. Upon discovering one of these graves, they reported their findings to the Polish underground state. Initially, the significance of this discovery was not fully grasped, as no one could have anticipated that such a grave would contain such a large number of victims. In the 1980s, mounting pressure from both the Polish and Soviet governments began to push for the release of documents about the Cotton Massacre. Polish academics sought to include Cotton on the agenda of the 1987 Joint Polish-Soviet Commission aimed at investigating censored episodes of Polish-Russian history. The turning point came in 1989 when Soviet scholars revealed that Joseph Stalin had indeed ordered the massacre. Then, in 1990, Mikhail Gorbachev publicly acknowledged that the NKVD had executed the Polish officers and confirmed the existence of two other burial sites similar to Katyn, Mednoy and Piatikaki. On October 30, 1989, Gorbachev granted permission for a delegation of several hundred Poles, organized by the Polish Association Families of Katyn Victims, to visit the Katyn Memorial. This group included former U.S. National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski. During the visit, a mass was held, and banners in support of the Solidarity Movement were placed at the site. One mourner even affixed a sign reading NKVD over the word Nazis in the inscription, changing it to in memory of Polish officers killed by the NKVD in 1941. Some visitors scaled the fence of a nearby KGB compound and left burning candles on the grounds. Brzezinski, reflecting on the visit, remarked, it isn't a personal pain that has brought me here, as is the case for the majority of these people, but rather the recognition of the symbolic significance of cotton. Russians and Poles, tortured to death, lie here together. It seems very important to me that the truth should be spoken about what took place, for only with the truth can the new Soviet leadership distance itself from the crimes of Stalin and the NKVD. Only the truth can serve as the foundation for true friendship between the Soviet and the Polish peoples. The truth will pave its path. I am convinced of this by the mere fact that I was able to travel here. His comments received extensive coverage on Soviet television. On April 13, 1990, the 47th anniversary of the discovery of the mass graves, the USSR formally expressed profound regret and admitted responsibility by the Soviet secret police for the Katyn massacre. Russia and Poland remained divided regarding the legal characterization of the Katyn massacre. The Polish perspective regarded it as an act of genocide and called for further investigations, as well as the complete disclosure of Soviet documents. In June 1998, Boris Yeltsin and Alexander Kwasniewski reached an agreement to construct memorial complexes at Katyn and Mednoy, the two NKVD execution sites located on Russian soil. In September of the same year, Russia also raised the issue of Soviet prisoner of war deaths in camps for Russian prisoners and internees in Poland between 1919 and 1924. It was reported that about 16,000 to 20,000 POWs had died in these camps due to communicable diseases. Some Russian officials argued that this amounted to a genocide comparable to Katyn. Similar claims were made in 1994, leading some, particularly in Poland, to view these attempts as highly provocative efforts by Russia to create an anti katyn narrative and balance the historical equation. The fate of Polish prisoners and internees in Soviet Russia during this period remains relatively under-researched. On February 4, 2010, the Prime Minister of Russia, Vladimir Putin, invited his Polish counterpart, Donald Tusk, to attend a Cotton Memorial service in April. The visit occurred on April 7, 2010, with Tusk and Putin jointly commemorating the 70th anniversary of the massacre. Before the visit, the 2007 film Cotton was shown on Russian state television for the first time. This move was seen by some as a result of Putin's intervention. However, on April 10, 2010, a tragic event occurred when an aircraft carrying Polish President Lech Kaczynski, his wife, and 87 other politicians and high-ranking army officers crashed in Smolensk under uncleared circumstances, resulting in the loss of all 96 people on board. These individuals were en route to attend a ceremony marking the 70th anniversary of the Katyn massacre. The crash deeply shocked the Polish nation, with Prime Minister Donald Tusk, who was not on the plane, describing it as the most tragic Polish event since the war. In the aftermath, numerous conspiracy theories circulated. 
This catastrophe also had significant international and Russian media coverage, prompting the rebroadcast of Cotton on Russian television. The Polish president was scheduled to deliver a speech at the formal commemorations, intending to honor the victims, emphasize the significance of the massacres in the context of post-war communist political history, and stress the need for Polish-Russian relations to focus on reconciliation. Although the speech was never delivered, it has been published in its original Polish and translated into English. In November 2010, the State Duma, the lower house of the Russian parliament, passed a resolution declaring that long classified documents show that the cotton crime was carried out on direct orders of Stalin and other Soviet officials. The declaration also called for further investigation to confirm the list of victims. However, members of the Duma from the Communist Party denied that the Soviet Union was responsible for the cotton massacre and voted against the declaration.